Welcome once again to FGE Gospel TV. I greet every one of you that are watching us either live or on the recording of this. Wherever country you may be watching us on or whatever room in the house you may be watching this broadcast in, I greet you in the wonderful and marvellous name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm excited to be here this Monday. And there's a telephone number that you can call us on, 07778690931. You can call us on later on. Right? If you're watching us live, don't phone that number now. But make a note of it. If you ever need prayer requests, we are there for you. We're there to pray for you. Well, I'm going to go straight in to the Word of God now. And I hope you've got your Bibles with you. Because I'm going to read... 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 7. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 to 7. It says, But I say this, He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he that sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. For each one of us, as he purposes in his heart, let him give, not of grief, all of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. The title of the message I want to speak on today is Your Attitude Determines Your Blessings. I say that again. Your Attitude Determines Your Blessings. A few days ago when I was in Manchester at one of the CNS churches, I spoke on the subject, the seed of thanksgiving is the seed of harvest. I'm not going to speak that message today, but part of that message inspired me to preach this message. I did teach this yesterday on my television broadcast that I do for the Dominion Christ Church in Wembley that goes out on channel 593. Faithwell Television at the Sky Channel. Now, I am not going to preach that message, but I'm just saying that something I said in there, in that message, inspired me to preach this message. Now, when I talk about sea time, when I use that scripture, but I say, who is so sparingly shall also reap sparingly, but he who is so bountifully shall also reap bountifully, some people are going to think, I know, Pastor McKeever is going to be preaching about money. He's going to be asking people to make a donation to the ministry. Well, you got it wrong. This message is not about getting you to give your money. This message is titled, Your Attitude Determines Your Blessing. If I want to achieve anything in this message, it's not to get you to get the money out of your wallet or your purse and send it to me. It's about dealing with your attitude. Now, if you want to support the ministry, you can do. And you can contact me and I can tell you how to do that. But this is not the aim of this message. So please do not think that this message is just aimed at getting you to make a donation to this ministry, to this television channel. No, that's not what it is all about. I know some people would assume that, and I can understand why, because as soon as some preachers start to preach about seed time and harvest, you can guarantee they're going to want to receive an offering. They're going to ask you to make a donation of hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds. No, 
I will not be doing that. I have not come here to do this broadcast in order to get money out of you. I've come here because I want to give you something. I want to bless you. I want you to know how you can be blessed of God. That's my purpose. So, in this message, your attitude determines your blessings. I am saying that your attitude behind your giving is just as important as what you give. You can make a donation to the Lord. You can be hard working in the church. You can do all the right things, but you can have a bad attitude. And God is interested in what you do, yes, but he's also interested in your motive, in your attitude, in your personality, in your disposition. He's interested in what lies behind what you are doing. That is why in that scripture, it doesn't just say God loves a giver. It said God loves a cheerful giver. Now, a definition of cheerful that I found in a dictionary is noticeably happy and optimistic. Happy and optimistic. God doesn't want us just to support the work of God. He wants us to be happy, enthusiastic in our support for the word of God. And that doesn't mean just in giving money, but it can also mean if you're giving yourself as a minister, as an usher, as a pastor, as a choir leader. God wants you to be happy and optimistic and enthusiastic about what you are doing. Your ministry should not be just a chore, whether it is an usher, a choir in a choir, whether it's sweeping the church, whether you're a deacon or a deaconess. It's not what you do, it's what lies behind what you do. God wants us to be happy and optimistic. Oh, I come into some churches, man, and I meet the ushers, and I think, so sometimes I see their faces, and I think, what cemetery did they come out of? Other churches I go into, and I see an usher, a smiling face, happy, contented, and I tell you, it makes me want to be in that church. I like a pastor who is enthusiastic about his ministry. I like singers that are enthusiastic about their ministry. That are happy, not just doing it because, well, I suppose I've got to earn my right. I'm trying to earn brownie points with God. Oh, I suppose I've got to do it. No, that's, that's the wrong attitude. God wants us to love what we're doing, to enjoy what we're doing, to be enthusiastic in our service. And as I said, that goes beyond financial giving. It means every area of your ministry, every area, whatever you're called into. As I've said, whether you're an usher, a choir leader, youth worker, pastor, deacon, he wants you to be enthusiastic about it. If you're going out knocking on doors, telling people about Jesus, if you're standing at an open air meeting, you should be happy. You should be enthusiastic. I tell you, when I do this broadcast here today, in my studio, I am enthusiastic about it. I am happy about it. I feel the anointing of God upon me. And the day it becomes just a task that I don't want to do, then I might as well not do it because God is not only interested in what you do, he's interested in what's in your heart while you're doing it. He's interested in your attitude in what you're doing. He's interested in what is motivating you. You see, friends, you may do the right thing, but if it's done out of a bad attitude, there is no blessing. There is no blessing. If it's done for the wrong motive, there will be no blessing. Look what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'm reading from verses 1 to 3. This is Paul speaking. If I speak with tongues of men and of angels. Now he's, he's talking about speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Spirit. He's talking about right speaking. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or clamming cymbal. You see, he's, he's speaking the right kind of words. He's talking the right kind of words. He's speaking in the tongues of men and angels. He's using the right kind of words. But he has no love. Preachers, it's not what you preach. It's 
What lies behind your preaching? Do you love the congregation? What is your attitude? Why are you doing it? And then in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 2, it said, And if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and I have all faith, so that as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Look what he's talking about. He's talking about having the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge. He's talking about having faith. That's great. It's great to have faith. It's great to have prophetic powers. It's great to be able to work miracles. But if you don't have love, you see, friends, what is behind what you are doing? What lies behind what you're doing? I have met men of men and women that have been used in the prophetic ministry, the miracle ministry, but their attitude stinks. Because that's why the Bible says it's by their fruit, not by their gift, you will know them. You can't tell how good a man is just by how many miracles, or how many people get saved, or how many people get healed. You, you judge a person by their fruit. And look what it says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3. And if I give away all that I have, and have delivered my body to burn, and have not love, I gain nothing. Now, it's... He says you give your money away. Now, obviously, if you give your money to charity, it's going to benefit people. It's going to benefit those that you help. If you give money to the homeless and you go out and buy food to the homeless, it's going to help them. Regardless of your, your attitude, it's going to help them. A meal, a meal given out of a bad attitude and a meal given out of a good attitude will still feed somebody. But the fact of the matter is they will be blessed by your giving, but you will gain nothing. You will not be blessed in your giving because your motivation is wrong, because your attitude is wrong, because God doesn't want you to do the right thing. He wants you to do it in the right spirit for the right reasons. I hope this is ministering to you. It is surely challenging me. Look what he says. If I deliver up my body to be burned, and that love, I gain nothing. He said, I gain. Now, obviously, those that he gives are going to gain, but he gains nothing. So let me make a note of this, friends. Make a note of this. One of these times, I'm going to get all these notes and put them on the screen as I'm ministering. I, one of these days, I'm, I'm hoping that I have somebody here that will operate the operate the, the system while I'm speaking, but I've got the mouse in my hand, and I'm doing it all while I'm speaking to you. Now look what he says. It's, no, make a note of this. Blessings come not just in what we do, are what we give, but the motive and attitude behind it. Let me say that again. Make a note of it. Blessings come not just in what we do, are what we give, but the motive and attitude that lies behind it. You see, friends, our, even praising God, it has there has to our heart has to be in it. We have to be doing it for the right reasons. No wonder the psalmist said in Psalms 138 verse 1, I will praise thee with my whole heart. Notice he didn't just say, I'm going to praise God with my mouth. I'm going to shout hallelujah, glory be to God. No, his heart is going to be in it. His attitude is right. His motivation is right. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason, but the psalm is that I'm going to praise God with all my heart. It talks about praising God with happy, with optimism, with enthusiasm. That's the way we should praise God. We should sing with enthusiasm and be optimistic. I tell you, I'm optimistic right now. I have to remind myself, keep your voice low, keep your voice low, because I tell you, I feel the power of God in me, and I'm getting so excited because I love to share the word of God. I don't only preach, I'm enthusiastic in my preaching. I love to minister, to, I love to minister because I love to help people and I love to see people grow. Psalms 9 verse 11, Psalms 9 verse 11. I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvellous works. There are some people that praise God, but their heart is not in it. The Bible talks about some people, it says they draw near me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. 
It's no good just saying, praise God, hallelujah, glory be to God. Is your heart in it? Or are you doing it out of some religious duty? No, that's not the way it should be. Make a note of this, number two, make a note of this. Our service to God must be done for the right reasons. For the right reasons. It says in Second Chronicles chapter 25 verse 2, referring to Amaziah, the king, look what it says, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Let me give that scripture again. It's talking about Amaziah, the king. Second Chron Chronicles 25 verse 2. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. His heart was not in it. I've met people that preach good, but their heart is not in it. I know people that sing in the choir, but their heart is not in it. I know ushers that do, that do their ushering, but their heart is not in it. We should be like the Apostle Paul who said, in 2 Chronicles 4 verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. He was enthusiastic. He wasn't preaching because he wanted to be admired. He wasn't a chore to him. He was doing it to the honour and the glory of the living God. Doing it for the right reasons. And in second, sorry, in Ephesians chapter six verse five, where Paul is talking about the attitude of slaves. Now I know he's talking about slaves and masters here, but we want to take that beyond that as just serving man to serving the Lord, because the same truth applies. Because Paul calls himself a bond slave of Christ. We are servants. We are slaves of Christ. We are servants of the living God. And that word servant in the Greek it means slaves. Ephesians 6 verse 5 it says servants be obedient to them that are your masters. That could be, that in a church situation could be a pastor. Now I know it's talking about slaves and masters here but put it in our situation. It could be obeying those that have authority over you. It can be your pastor, your deacons, your even at your workplace. Even at your workplace. Doing it, going to the work with the right attitude will get you, get you promoted. Ephesians 6 verse 5, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart, as unto Christ. No, he said, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Oh, friends, don't just preach the gospel. If you're a pastor, don't just preach to be a man pleaser. Don't just sing to be admired from the congregation. Don't just do it to be seen, but do it to the honour and glory of the living God. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a pastor who does his ministry with enthusiasm, with the right attitude, in the right disposition. Ephesians 6 with good will, doing service, as to the Lord, and not to man, knowing that for whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Notice, God is saying here, that when we do things out of the right reason, for the right motives, with the right attitude, God is going to bless, he's going to reward you. Now, you may be hated, by the people you're trying to help. Your congregation may not like your preaching. Men may turn against you. But when we love them, and the Bible says that we should love our enemies, and pray for them that persecute us, when we do things for the right reason, for the right motive, we're going to be blessed. I hear people say, well, I did this and I did that, and God didn't bless me. Well, maybe your attitude was wrong. Maybe your motive was wrong. Number three, make a note of this. Our prayers will be answered when we pray for the right reason in the right way. Maybe some people, your prayers are not being answered because what lies behind your prayer is wrong. Your attitude is wrong. 
Your motivation is wrong. And that's why your prayers are not being answered. Because God is interested in not only that we pray for the right thing, but we want the right thing for the right reason. For instance, somebody can be praying, Oh God, I want to be a pastor. But why do you want to be a pastor? Is it to help people? Is it to minister to people? Is it to serve people? Or is it so that everyone can call you reverend? Everybody can admire you. You can be seen. Then your motive is wrong. You may be praying for a new car. But why do you want a new car? Is it because you want that car to serve God, to help, help others, help your family? Or is it just so you can show off to your neighbours your new car? Your attitude, your motive will determine your blessing. Look what James says in James chapter 4 verses 3. And James 4 verse 3. Ye ask and receive not because you ask amiss. That you may consume it upon your lust. Let me read that from another translation, a good news Bible. It says, and when you ask, you do not receive, because your motives are bad. You ask for things to use for your own pleasure. Are you praying for God to bless you in the ministry so you can go on an ego trip to be admired? Are you in the choir because you want people to see you? Are you singing in the church because you want people to be impressed by your singing? God will not anoint you. God will not anoint you with the Holy Spirit to go on an ego trip. God does not fill men and women with the Holy Spirit to go on an ego trip. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit will come, he will glorify me. And put a pastor who is led by the Holy Spirit, a usher that is moving in the Spirit, a choir leader, a deacon, a deaconess, etc., when they are doing it under the anointing, they will not be thinking how good I am. They'll be doing it to the honour and the glory of God. And, that, and only when we are doing it to the glory of God are we doing it in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not come to glorify a man. It will come in the man to glorify Jesus. What we want may be good, but is our motives right? I once read a, about a woman who came to an evangelist, she had cancer of the throat and she went forward for healing and the evangelist asked a very strange question, why do you want to be healed? Now I thought, if I was reading that, I stopped, I think, that's a strange question. Somebody with cancer, it's obvious why they want to be healed, is it? I thought it was a strange question, but then the woman's answer showed a motive. And this is what she said to the evangelist. She said, well, before I had cancer of the throat, I used to smoke a lot. I used to enjoy a cigarette. But when I got the cancer, I had to give up smoking. If God will only heal me, I can enjoy a cigarette again. You see, a motive was wrong. There's nothing wrong in wanting healing. But what lies be what is your motive behind it? There's nothing wrong in praying for a partner, praying for your business to succeed, praying to do well in the ministry. But what is your motive? What is your attitude that lies behind it that's important? I remember hearing a story about a man that went to T.L. Osborne's meeting. Now, T.L. Osborne was a great man of God, mightily used of God. And a man went to his meeting. He was taken there by friends who carried him in because he could not walk. And as he lay there and listened to the man of God preached, the anointing of God went through him and he was completely healed. He got up and he ran around praising God that he could walk. And that night, he went into a pub, started drinking, getting drunk, celebrating the fact that he could now walk. And then he went to a nightclub, picking up women, dancing with women, cuddling and caressing women, celebrating the fact that he could walk. He went to bed that night, he went to sleep, 
and when he woke up next day, he couldn't walk. You see, you there's nothing wrong in be, wanting to be healed, but God ain't going to heal you so you can serve the devil. God ain't going to make your body strong so you can serve the devil. God ain't going to put you as in a position in the church so you can go on an ego trip. God ain't going to bless your ministry, bless your marriage, bless your life, bless your ministry so you can go on an ego trip. No, 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 no. It has to be done to the honour and the glory of the living God. I challenge you, friend, what is your real reason? What is your real reason? When you preach the message in a church, do you hang around for praise? When you sing well in a church, are you waiting to be admired? Are you an usher in a church? Do you do it to the glory of God? There are some people that do it to be seen of man. And if the pastor of the church acknowledges one usher and not the other usher, the usher gets upset because they want to be known, they want to be seen. They're doing it for the wrong reasons. You see, friends, you can be the best in what you do, but your attitude will determine your success. You can be the greatest pastor, the best preacher, the best mechanic, the best hairdresser, but your attitude will determine your success. Let me explain. I had a builder that used to come to my house. I gave him a lot of work. But he had a bad attitude to work. He was a good builder, done a good job. But he was unreliable, a bad attitude. I'd be, I'd be waiting in for him, he wouldn't turn up. He'd come one day and then four days. A job that he'd done downstairs, it should have been done in two weeks. It took him nearly three months to do it. To, Going over weeks without even turning up. And that was an excuse every time. Now, I know he's good. I can no longer use him. I found another builder that's got a better attitude. He will come every day until the job is done. The other builder, he would give me a price. And if he couldn't, and then he would start to moan at the end. Oh dear, I'm not making no money, this got to be done, that's got to be done. But the other builder, he's very good. He, he'll quote me how much it's going to be. And then he, he'll come along with something that he didn't notice. Because when you're doing building work, sometimes you find things that you didn't know about. And then he would tell me, he said, look, this is like this. I can paint over it, or I can repair it. If you're going to repair it, it's going to take me longer. I can make a decision. You see, he had a better attitude. So I use him, even though the other builder is probably more qualified, I will use this one because he does a good job and he's reliable and he's got a good attitude because your attitude will determine your success. You can be a, the best hairdresser in the business, but if your attitude is wrong, people won't want to come to you. You see, friends, if you're running a business, if you're running a church, people have got to like you as much as they like your message. They've got to love you as much as they love what you're preaching if they're going to continue to come. So I know some people, women, that will travel all across London to go to an hairdresser, even though there is one near them that does a good job. They'll come to this one. Why? Because the hairdresser has a good attitude, takes care, makes the, makes the client seem comfortable. And I'll tell you, friends, it's no good doing a good job. You, you should do a good job, but your attitude has to be right. You have to treat that client as the most important person. And it's also important the other way around. It's no good having a good attitude and no good at your job. You've got to have both. Yes, you've got to be a good hairdresser, you've got to be a good builder, you've got to be a good mechanic. And people will come to you. If you're a good mechanic, you do a good job, and you've got a good attitude towards your customers, they will, bring your, they will bring their car over and over again, and they will recommend you. I, as a pastor, I know some wonderful preachers that preach well, but I wouldn't have them preach, and I wouldn't recommend them, because their attitude stinks. But if, you, if your attitude is right, your motivation is right, your purpose is right, people will come to you, and they will recommend you. You could be an usher in the church, do a good job, but your attitude stinks. And I tell you, friends, if you're a pastor and you've got an usher, a bad attitude, get rid of that usher. 
Because when visitors come to the church, that usher is the most important person in that meeting. Not the pastor, not the deacon, not the preacher, not the choir, that usher. Why? Because the first person they see when they go in the church is that usher. The first impression that they get of that church is going to be the usher. And if they, you come in, you've got a friendly usher, one that helps, a smile on their face, would do anything for you, knows how to talk to people, they will come in the meeting and they'll be contented. But that usher, a bad attitude, upset someone, they're going to, be, they're going to remain upset throughout the service, no matter how well that preacher is preaching, they're not going to enjoy it because that usher has got them in a bad mood. I tell you, friend, it's no good being good at a job. You've got to have a good attitude. You've got to be motivated for the right reasons. The Bible actually tells us about one woman in the Bible that is mentioned. She got a blessing that she should not have had at a time that she should not have received it because she had the right attitude. I say that again. Yes, there is a woman in the Bible who had a good attitude and she got what she shouldn't have got at a time that she shouldn't have got it. And it's found in Mark chapter 7, verse 26. Mark 7, verse 26. It says, The woman was a Greek, a Seraphesian by nation. She besought him, that's Jesus, that he would cast forth the devil out of her daughter. She was a Gentile. And the, the blessings were not for the Gentiles. At that particular time, Jesus was not ministering to the Gentiles. He told his disciples, go not but to the lost house of Israel. Jesus told the woman at the well, you worship, you know not what, for salvation is of the Jews. And that dispensation, salvation was only for the Jews. Jesus was only sending his disciples out to the lost house of Israel to minister to the Jewish nation. She was not a Jew. Thank God today, Jesus went on the cross. He, he, he paid the price for the sins of the world. And now salvation is for the Jews and the Gentiles because in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile. The same God over all is rich unto all that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But she wasn't in the dispensation. She wasn't in that dispensation. She wasn't at the time when Jesus had died for the whole world. So salvation was still for the Jews. And even after the day of, even after Jesus died, and even after the day of Pentecost, Peter didn't understand that. The disciples didn't understand that. God had to reveal it to Peter that the Gentiles were now included because of the cross and sent him down to Cornelius. But this woman lived in a time when salvation, a healing, the ministry of God was only for the Jewish nation. And look what happened. And Jesus said, let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Now she could have instantly had a bad attitude. She could have, you're calling me a dog? I'm a gentle. I'm going to go to the race relations board. You're a racist. You called me a dog. You're discriminating against me on the grounds of my race. She could have had a bad attitude, but look at her attitude. Look at her attitude. And she answered and said unto him, Yea, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. What was she saying? Yes, Lord, I know that the time of the Gentiles has not yet come. I know, I know that you're, you were sent to the Jewish nation, and I know it's your responsibility, but even the dogs eat the crumbs, and that's what I'm asking for. I'm not asking to sit at the table. I'm asking for the crumbs. Oh, what a wonderful attitude. Oh, what a godly attitude. And look what Jesus said. For this saying, go thy way, the devil is gone out of thy daughter. And when she was come to her house, she found the devil gone out of her. And her daughter laid upon the bed. Her attitude brought the blessing. Your attitude will determine your blessing. 
I remember hearing a story about a woman in Jamaica who became a Christian. She became a child of God. Her husband was not a Christian and he was determined to make life miserable for her. But she carried on loving him. She did not retaliate to him. She carried on loving him, showing the love of God. The Bible says, love your enemies. Aren't you glad that, that God loved us when we were his enemies? That Jesus died for us when we were enemies? Thank God the only reason you love him today is because he first loved you. And Jesus, and this woman in Jamaica, she done everything. Prayed for him, sought him, looked after him, loved him. And one day she came home. He came home for dinner and she put the food on the table. And the man instantly got hold of the food and threw it on the floor. Throw it on the floor. Now what would be your attitude if that was done to you? How would you retaliate? But it's under pressure that your attitude is shown. The man was expecting her to start shouting, swearing, cursing. The devil is looking to see how you behave when you're going for a trial. But she humbled herself. She got on the floor, picked up the food and said, I'm very sorry, darling. I should be a better wife. I should have cooked you a better meal. You know what happened? That husband broke down. Tears came to his eyes. And he gave his life to Jesus. The husband was saved because of the attitude of the wife. Churches will grow when there is the right attitude, the right motivation, the right purpose. Your business will grow. Your marriage will succeed. You see, friends, sometimes people do all the right things. They, they go out, they work hard, they bring the food home. They buy stuff for their children, they remember their birthdays, but their attitude is wrong. They're doing the right thing, but their attitude is wrong. And they're destroying their marriage, they're destroying the family life. One of the things, friends, we need to get rid of the stinking attitude, because your attitude will determine your blessing. Somebody once sent me a picture on Facebook, and it was of a flat tire. And I remember the words on it, it said, your attitude is like a flat tire. You won't go anywhere until you change it. Are you prepared to change your attitude? I hope this message will bless you. I hope this message will encourage you and help you. Well, we've come to the end of this broadcast. And I hope this has blessed you. Remember that telephone number? Zero four seven 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 eight six nine zero nine three one. We'd love to hear from you. And until we meet again, this is Pastor David McKibbitt saying unto you that no matter what the problem may be, Jesus is the answer. I love you, but my Jesus, he loves you more. God bless you. Eternal life is a free gift. From God, Jesus died for you at Calvary. He is the way, the truth, the life, the door. If you believe in Him, you shall be saved. God's God's free gift to you is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord.